Among the major scientific accomplishments of the 20th century was the discovery that DNA present in all living cells is responsible for passing genetic information from generation to generation. DNA had been discovered back in the mid-1800s, but it took almost 100 years from its discovery for DNA's role in heredity to be understood. As recently as the 1940s, many scientists considered DNA an unlikely candidate to carry heritable information because it is a simple molecule made of up of just four different nucleic acids, providing a very small four-letter alphabet with which to describe the diversity of life. Protein, which is much more abundant in living cells and contains 20 different amino acids, provided what scientists felt was a much more complex system to carry the information. The work that ultimately led scientists to accept DNA's role was triggered by the discovery of transformation by the British bacteriologist Fred Griffith. Transformation is the process by which bacterial cells incorporate genetic material from other cells, thereby acquiring new traits. Griffith was interested in the spread and control of epidemics. As part of his work, he studied variations in the virulence of different strains of disease-causing organisms, including pneumococcus, a bacteria known to be a major cause of pneumonia. Griffith believed that studying differences between strains would lead to improved ability to control infectious diseases and aid in the development of vaccines. It was during his work studying differences between strains of pneumococcus that he discovered transformation. When virulent strains of this bacteria were isolated from infected individuals and grown on blood auger plates, the colonies that formed had a smooth, shiny, somewhat translucent appearance. Not all pneumonia outbreaks were caused by the same strain of bacteria, so Griffith developed a technique called slide agglutination, which allowed him to distinguish between different groups of pneumococcus bacteria, which he referred to as types. His standard procedure for assessing the virulence of a type strain was to grow it in a culture and then expose a mouse to the strain. If the mouse died and the strain of the same type was able to be re-isolated from the infected mouse, the strain was considered virulent. The shiny, smooth characteristic of the virulent strains is due to the presence of a polysaccharide capsule secreted by the bacteria. The capsule plays a role in virulence by helping cells avoid the host immune system. As part of his work in studying how virulence varied between strains, Griffith developed methods to reduce the virulence of individual strains by manipulating their culture conditions. The avirulent strains he created were easy to recognize when grown on auger plates because they lacked the capsule, resulting in colonies that were less shiny and had rough edges. And while their appearance on the plates changed, they were still identifiable as the same type using the slide agglutination method. The inability of a rough strain to cause disease could be demonstrated with the mouse challenge. Exposing mice to a rough strain did not result in any disease, and bacteria were not isolated from the exposed mice. All of this work set him up to discover transformation. The mouse assay and the rough, smooth difference allowed him to assess the virulence of different strains, and the slide agglutination technique allowed him to distinguish between strains independent of virulence. Griffith also worked with heat-killed cells and showed that like the avirulent rough strains, heat-killed cells from virulent strains did not cause disease in mice. This might seem like an odd experiment to perform, but both avirulent strains and heat-killed cell debris from virulent strains are tools that can be used in vaccine development. But in order for them to be useful, there has to be no chance of the material reverting to disease-causing state. To further understand the stability of these non-disease-causing conditions, Griffith mixed the living avirulent cultures with the heat-killed virulent strain to see how combining them affected mice. This is the experiment that led him to discover transformation because he found that mixing living avirulent cells from one type of pneumonococcus with dead cell debris from a virulent strain of a different type did cause disease in the exposed mice. And surprisingly, the bacteria that were isolated from the infected mice matched the heat-killed virulent strain, both in that the colonies were smooth and the disease-causing cells matched the slide agglutination type of the dead culture, meaning something in the heat-killed cell debris from the virulent strain was able to transform the avirulent type 2 strain into the virulent type 1 strain. Griffith's findings were quickly reproduced by a number of different researchers, leading to efforts to identify the transforming principle that must be present in the cell debris. 
While Griffith's initial approach to inducing transformation relied on passing the mixture through mice, it was not long before other researchers figured out how to achieve the same thing without mice. So that all that was needed was to mix heat-killed cell debris from one type with a living culture of a different type under the appropriate culture conditions. Successful transformation would result in a mixture of living cells from both types. It was with this method that Avery, McLeod, and McCarty showed in a 1944 paper that the material in the dead cell debris responsible for transformation was made of DNA. Their work was very thorough. They took a number of approaches, but the most widely described set of experiments involved exposing the heat-killed cell debris to a variety of different treatments to see if the transforming principle could be removed or deactivated. To do this, they used enzymes that degrade different cellular components. The first step was to purify the cell debris, removing lipids, carbohydrates, and other cellular material. This was the, an untreated extract of a virulent culture of a known slide agglutination type which grew as smooth colonies on agar plates. The extract was mixed with a live culture of a rough avirulent strain of a different type under conditions where transformation will occur. Growing on agar plates resulted in the growth of both cell types, indicating that the removal of lipids and carbohydrates did not remove the transforming principle. This extract was then treated with a protease, which is an enzyme that breaks down protein. Using the same system, they showed that the transformation still occurred, indicating that the transforming principle was not made of protein. Next, the extract was exposed to an RNase, which destroys RNA in the extract. The transformation test was again successful, with a mixture of both type 1 smooth and type 2 rough cells growing on the plate, indicating that the transforming principle was not made from protein or RNA. Finally, the extract was treated with a DNA enzyme to degrade the DNA in the sample. After this treatment, a final transformation trial was done, and in this treatment only type 2 rough cells grew. In other words, in the absence of DNA, no transformation occurred, demonstrating that the transforming principle is made of DNA, and by extension, this showed that DNA is the molecule that controls inheritance. Resistance to the idea that such a simple molecule as DNA was the information molecule meant that these findings were not immediately accepted. But over time, this experiment, widely referred to as the avery mcleod mccarty experiment, has become recognized as the turning point in recognition of DNA's central role in heredity. If you found this video helpful, please consider sharing it and giving it a thumbs up. Feel free to comment with any questions or suggestions. And if you want to keep up with the content here at Science Primer, click the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.